Hello everyone. This video is intended to complement the VFR workshops that Keith Smith from the Pilot Edge Network has been giving over the last several weeks on TeamSpeak. The first two workshops covered the basics of U.S. airspace organization, chart interpretation, flight planning, pilotage, and radio communications for VFR flights between uncontrolled airports. Both of those workshops are available on YouTube. Workshop 3 covered planning, navigation, and radio comms for VFR flights between towered airports, but due to some technical problems there isn't a recording of Workshop 3. This video and a subsequent companion will cover most of the same elements as the workshop did, with an emphasis on the practical side of planning and flying short VFR cross-country flights within the constraints of the U.S. Air Traffic Control System and FAA regulations. This flight will be a short hop from Montgomery Field in Southern California to Ramona Airport, also in Southern California. Indeed, the uh, two airports are only 18 nautical miles in a straight line away from each other. But as we're going to see very shortly here, we can't uh, fly that straight line distance. The uh, airspace uh, rules won't allow it. So let's uh, dive into the planning a little bit. First, just looking at the straight line uh, between the two airports, right away we'll notice that it crosses through this big complicated set of blue lines around here, which represent the Class Bravo airspace over uh, both uh, uh, San Diego International Airport as well as Miramar um, Marine uh, Air Station, which is uh, located here just north of Montgomery Field. And we can see that the, uh, the uh, just as a reminder, the the airspace here around uh, Bravo is divided up into uh, uh, sections which each cover a different set of altitudes. So this section right here, for example, covers from the surface all the way up to 10,000 feet. Proceeding out to the east, it does 1,800 feet to 10,000, 3,200 feet to 10,000, 38 to 10,000, and then the last shelf is at uh, from 4,800 feet to 10,000. All of these altitudes are MSL, mean sea level. So uh, this particular set of um, uh, a section of the Bravo is intended to protect arrivals that are coming into uh, Miramar, uh, which you could see it's pretty well lined up right with the uh, uh, approach corridor into the airport. And uh, Ramona Airport itself sits just under the very edge of the uh, shelf. Uh, the um, uh, in indeed the the Montgomery Airport itself is also under the uh, Class Bravo airspace, uh, and the floor of it there for the entire section right in this area is at 4,800 feet. So for sure, we uh, cannot fly through this segment here because it, uh, the airspace is controlled all the way down to the surface. We can't. We, practically speaking, can't fly in this segment here because that's very low, 1,800 feet. So the uh, our path to the Ramona Airport is going to, uh, at bare minimum, going to be able to use this, uh, have to be under this shelf of the Bravo, and probably more practically speaking is going to be need to be under this shelf as we uh, uh, go from Montgomery to the Ramona Airport. So immediately that suggests that our flight path is going to have to look something like this. And um, that would, from a, as long as we don't climb above uh, 3,800 feet, uh, actually have to be below 3,800 feet, we will be able to uh, make the flight following a path approximately like this. Now, if we're going to just do this flight using uh, visual references to the ground, uh, using pilotage, looking out our window to find landmarks that confirm where we are, and perhaps a little bit of dead reckoning, which is to uh, time the, uh, uh, the amount of time it takes us to get from a known fixed point to another known fixed point based upon how fast we're going, um, then we're probably not going to be able to fly this exact route with any kind of precision. And it is critically important that we remain clear of these little uh, slices of the, uh, of the Miramar class Bravo. So it's very important that we have some good landmarks on the ground that will uh, let us conduct this flight uh, in VFR conditions without um, uh, violating any of the uh, Bravo airspace. So uh, there are a couple things we can look at on the ground right away. One of them, and probably the most obvious one, is um, the Gillespie Airport right here. So that will be a very, very 
um, clear and easy to see landmark and it takes us pretty much in the direction that we want to go in order to be able to go around the corner here as is depicted on the flight plan right now. Now beyond Gillespie Airport then we need to know when to make our left turn to be able to head up towards the Ramona Airport and so the question is is what kind of good landmarks are there around the area that we could use? Well, one of them, there's a golf course right here, and in fact this little magenta flag here indicates that this is a VFR reporting point, likely for uh, planes on their way into uh, Montgomery Field. It's too close to Gillespie probably to be a reporting point for that, although possibly it's used for that. The other thing of note here is another a visual reporting point, which is Lake Jennings. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, for me, golf courses, unless I'm extremely familiar with the uh, airspace already, don't make the world's greatest visual landmarks just because there are so many of them in Southern California. Um, but the combination of a golf course and this little lake here, and note that really we could turn almost anywhere in between them, makes a pretty good combination between the two. So why don't we go ahead and, uh, and use Lake Jennings here as our uh, planned um, visual waypoint that we will use and at that point then we can turn uh, go ahead and turn uh, north and head up towards the Ramona Airport. Now Ramona Airport itself has a couple of visual reporting points to let them know so that you can clearly let them know where you are and they when you use the name um, like for example San Vicente Island here or the Barona Casino, Casino here uh, will be um, a common language between you and the air traffic controller you're talking to to let them know exactly where you are. So we should plan to use these reporting points when we're inbound to uh, the Ramona Airport to let them know where we are. There's another interesting thing about this uh, San Vicente Island reporting point which is that it is the f as long as we stay on the east side of this little island we will definitely be uh, in the correct uh, Bravo sector where we can fly as high as say 3,700 feet without um, in any way interfering w uh, or worrying about intruding upon uh, the Bravo. We will definitely be under the Bravo shelf. And then as we make our way further north here and cross the uh, Oceanside 106 uh, radial, which is uh, what how this particular piece of the shelf is defined, which we can tell by looking right there, then we'll be well under the shelf at that point. And uh, since the Ramona Airport uh, is at uh, basically 1,400 feet, uh, expect a pattern altitude of around, uh, say, 2,400 feet or a little bit lower, 2,300 feet, then um, we will be very comfortably able to uh, make this transition from Lake Jennings to Ramona uh, th through this little corridor right here without worrying about violating the Bravo. So indeed, uh, why don't we just go ahead and plan that we're going to uh, make our uh, uh, path go right by that island and just then as we go by it we'll make sure we keep it to our left so we'll fly something like about there and then we will not only have a good reporting point for the Ramona Tower when it's time for us to call them but we'll also uh, have a, um, uh, a great deal of confidence that we are safely under the uh, the Miramar Bravo shelf. And really this is about the extent of what we have to worry about from uh, from the perspective of planning for this flight except for one other thing which is what altitude are we going to fly at? Well we know already that we have to be uh, below 3700 feet um, but let's uh, just have a peek and see if there are any other altitude constraints that we have to deal with. And right away, since we've decided that we were going to use uh, the Gillespie Airport as one of our navigation points along the way, um, we have to pay attention to the fact that this is a class Delta Airport. And uh, we can tell that in a couple of different ways. One is because it has a tower, since we have frequencies here, and also because of this dashed blue line, which depicts the extent of the uh, class Delta airspace for uh, Gillespie Tower. And uh, like all class deltas, it has a, uh, a horizontal or a lateral extent depicted by the blue line, but it also has a vertical extent, and that's depicted by the little bracketed square number here, 24, which means that the, uh, that the top of the delta is at 2,400 feet. So as long as we are 
uh, above 2,400 feet as we cross over Gillespie Airport, we will not be in the Delta. And we will uh, not even have to talk to the Gillespie Tower um, as long as we're above that altitude. So uh, that is a second element of our planning is that once we take off, we have to climb so that we are uh, above 2,400 feet. And then uh, once we have made our turn um, uh, up towards uh, Ramona Airport, we have to make sure that we are below 3,800 feet. And by the time we get to Ramona Airport, we need to be down at the pattern altitude of around 2,300 or 2,400 feet. So <clears throat> that gives us a pretty comfortable range to use. And now we'll take a just a brief moment to consider the VFR altitudes and whether or not the rules for those apply. Under normal circumstances, if we are eastbound, then we need to be at a uh, odd thousand plus 500 feet. And if we are westbound, then we need to be at an even thousand plus 500 feet for VFR cruising altitudes. That, uh, in this particular case, appears like it's going to create a little bit of a problem. But it turns out uh, turns out it's not going to be for uh, one other part of the VFR cruising altitude rules. Those rules only apply when you are above 3,000 feet AGL, above ground level. So as we uh, examine the, uh, the uh, general altitudes of the airports here, we can see that um, uh, Montgomery Field itself is at about 400 feet and then uh, the Gillespie Airport is just a little bit uh, lower than that actually at about 300 feet and then the Ramona Airport is up at uh, uh, 1400 feet so with the 3000 AGL rule um, for the VFR cruising altitudes to come into effect we uh, would have to be by the time we got to Ramona we could be all the way up at uh, 4300 feet uh, or just a little under that and uh, still not need to be following the rules for the VFR uh, altitudes. And if our planned route here takes us to, uh, say, 3,000 feet f uh, as soon as we have departed as quickly as we can, anyway, after departing the Montgomery Field Airport, that would take us nicely over the Gillespie Airport above the Class Delta, and it would keep us nicely under the um, the 3,800 foot limitation for the floor of the Bravo at this particular place for Miramar. Now the other thing we of course need to consider is the terrain and one thing to notice right away is we can there are several contour lines here that tell us we've got uh, 1,500 feet of altitude, 2,000 foot, the ground is at 2,000 feet here. This uh, El Cajon Mountain here is at 3,675 feet. There's a peak over here, Iron Mountain, which is at uh, just about 2,700 feet. So it looks like uh, the choice of somewhere between 3,000 and 3,500 feet is going to be just fine uh, as long as we make sure we keep the mountain well on our right so that uh, we don't drive into that. Um, and uh, uh, that will uh, get us nicely over um, Gillespie Airport as well. So we'll plan uh, on 3500 feet we might change our minds about that if we run into any clouds or anything there but we know we can fly anywhere between 3000 and 3500 uh, and we will comfortably be able to uh, uh, clear all of the terrain and all the obstacles and make our way to the Ramona airport and have plenty of time uh, to descend down to pattern altitude once we've uh, crossed um, the, this little ridge of mountains that we can see depicted on the terrain here. So one or two other considerations uh, is one thing we have to ask ourselves is depending upon what kind of airplane we're going to be flying in and assume it's a it's a, a light uh, single-engine piston aircraft a Cessna 172 or a Cessna 182 something like that um, the question we should ask ourselves is, given the rate of climb available uh, in that aircraft, will we be able to reach, uh, to say, 2,500 feet before we reach the edge of the uh, delta boundary for the Gillespie Airport, which is right here? So we can use our uh, sky vector planning tool here to just have a look, and we can see that that's only about four nautical miles from the Montgomery Field Airport to the edge of the uh, of the Gillespie Delta. 
Now, our actual route of flight from the uh, Montgomery Field Airport, uh, depending on the winds, but since winds in Southern California are very typically out of the west, we can anticipate that we'll be taking off either uh, on runway um, uh, 28, one of the runway 28 pairs here, or the runway 24 here, which will take us initially out this direction. We'll be making a 180 degree sort of downwind departure out of the airport and then uh, making our way towards Montgomery Field. So the question is, in say four or five miles, can we climb from 400 feet, the field elevation at Montgomery, to 2,500 feet, or about um, uh, 2,000 feet, roughly, of climb that we need to achieve in about four miles. This is actually closer to five miles in real life. Uh, Sky Vector rounds down to the uh, nearest mile, and uh, uh, this distance here is, is actually probably closer to five miles than four miles. So we know we're going to be, uh, during our climb speed, we may be climbing at only 70 or 80 knots, um, which means that we're covering uh, a mile in uh, just over a minute. So we've got about uh, four minutes, perhaps, to uh, from the time we leave Montgomery Field until we enter the delta. And if we're climbing at uh, uh, a even conservative 700 or 800 feet per minute, then uh, that will indeed, uh, our expectation would be that we can um, make the climb to 2,500 feet that we need in order to get on top of the uh, uh, delta. But what if, uh, what if the plane that we're flying just happens to be climbing like a pig that day? We're at max gross weight with uh, three passengers who all had a heavy lunch and uh, we've got a full fuel load and it's hot and it's humid. Uh, so the worst possible conditions for the climb, and, and we're only managing to climb at 400 feet per minute, which would not let us uh, clear the delta before we get into it. So does that mean that we can't fly this route? Does that mean that we would have to go all the way around the delta? Unfortunately, the answer is no. It's perfectly okay for us to ask Gillespie Tower to be able to transit the delta from the uh, west to the east here. We just have to call them uh, and let them know that we uh, uh, need to transition the delta, uh, give them our altitude and our position, uh, which will need to be before we actually enter the delta, and um, then under most normal circumstances, barring unusual things going on, they will give us permission to transition across their airspace uh, and usually maintaining some sort of a minimum altitude. And uh, that way, even if we haven't yet quite gotten to the, the altitude that would take us above their airspace, we can still fly this same route under almost all conditions, although we have to be prepared for the fact that it's possible they could say we're not allowed to enter the delta and have to stay clear of it. If that were to occur, we would indeed then have to kind of divert down this direction and, and even potentially go all the way around the delta, at least um, continue in this direction until we had climbed above uh, uh, the 2400 feet which represents the top of the Delta airspace for Gillespie. The distance from uh, this time when we take off, or maybe a better way to say it is the amount of time from when we take off until we're within range of their uh, of the Gillespie Delta is really not very long so we do have to be prepared fairly quickly to communicate to Gillespie Tower. We should have their frequency dialed in uh, on our uh, standby frequency and we should be ready to switch to it pretty quickly as soon as uh, we can get uh, a release from Montgomery Tower a and indeed I think there's something that we can do uh, in advance which is to let Montgomery Tower know that we want to change frequencies pretty quickly so that we can in case we need to coordinate a Delta transition with Gillespie and you'll see during the practical flight uh, of how we might do that. So is there anything else now that we need to worry about? We've got our altitude figured out, we've got <clears throat> our strategy for how we're going to uh, cross uh, the Gillespie Delta in case we can't get high enough in time to go over it right away. We've decided uh, what our visual landmarks are going to be uh, beyond Gillespie. We're looking for uh, a golf course kind of a little bit to the north east which will be off our left wing. Uh, there's some athletic fields here as well and then the large very obvious landmark will be uh, Lake Jennings. At that point we'll make our left turn go up to uh, San Vicente Island, call Ramona Tower with our position report and our request for landing and then uh, we'll just at that point 
come inbound to Ramona. From this position, it's not completely clear uh, what uh, Ramona Tower is going to want us to do for the actual approach to the airport. There's a couple of possibilities here. Um, a very likely one, assuming that they're landing uh, runway 27, which is uh, from uh, east to uh, west, uh, a, a very strong possibility is that they would give us a, uh, a left base entry, which would look something like that. That would be maybe a two mile or two and a half mile uh, left base entry. That would be um, not unexpected at all to get uh, an approach like that. Uh, it's also possible though that for whatever reasons they might give us a standard um, uh, left downwind entry which would then cause us to, if I can uh, depict this, which would look something then like this. And we won't know uh, what they're going to give us until we actually uh, make the report over San Vicente Island and then uh, then we just follow whichever uh, pattern that they have uh, asked us to do. So we'll just clean this up for the moment. Okay, one last little bit of fine-tuning we'll do for the plan then is simply where we're actually going to fly the airplane uh, from the perspective of um, the Gillespie Airport. Uh, we, you certainly can plan to fly right over the top of the airport, but I personally don't like to do that because uh, for the Cessna 172 we're going to be using for this flight, visibility over the nose is really poor. And so I like to plan my visual landmarks to be just a little bit uh, too the uh, to the uh, left uh, outside my left window so that I can see the landmark very clearly off my left side a little bit and um, that way I don't have any ambiguity about when I've actually reached that visual waypoint and um, uh, and it's time for me to make my uh, turn if that's what I need to do at that particular waypoint. So we'll fly a little bit more to the south of Gillespie Field rather than uh, just off the top. And similarly for uh, Lake Jennings, we will uh, just make it a little bit off of our left wing so that it's just a little easier to see when we've got to cr uh, when we cross the actual waypoints on our way in. Uh, Sky Vector does a very nice job of giving us our uh, approximate headings that we're going to need to be able to uh, reach our, dis our uh, waypoints that we've decided upon. So we'll have a heading of roughly uh, 080 degrees out of um, once we've completed the downwind um, departure from Montgomery Field. Then we'll make a left turn to about 047, looking for Lake Jennings, make a, another left turn to 325, and then uh, fly, fly not quite but almost uh, to the north for our uh, 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 to, uh, as we leave San Vicente Island towards uh, Ramona. Of course the actual the actual direction we depart out of San Vicente is going to depend upon the approach that the uh, Ramona Tower wants us to fly. And then finally one last little thing which is it's it's uh, uh, there, since there aren't any real obvious landmarks around here to warn us when we are uh, approaching the edge of the Delta airspace for a Gillespie, or even other than if we don't see Gillespie right away because we don't know the airport, um, another handy thing we can do is take advantage of the fact that we do have DME in the airplane, and we do have a uh, DME-capable VOR sitting right here at Mission Bay. So let's just get some sense of how far a couple of these critical places are from the, uh, the Mission Bay uh, VOR. And we can do that by cheating a little bit here with, um, uh, with the Sky Vector planning tools. We'll put a waypoint for the moment there at the Mission Bay VOR. And then we will grab another one and put it here. And we can see that this is about nine miles from the Mission Bay VOR. It's a nine DME from Mission Bay to um, the edge of the Gillespie Delta. And then it's another uh, four miles, or about 13 miles DME, to our um, to the Gillespie Airport itself. So if we haven't sighted Gillespie by the time we're 13 uh, miles from uh, 
a Mission Bay VOR, then something is not right and we should be starting to figure out exactly what's going on because we definitely should see it right after our left wing at about 13 DME. Then finally, uh, our Lake Jennings is going to be about another six nautical miles along the way there. Uh, and so what we have here is a total of 9, 13, and 5 is uh, 18. So Lake Jennings should appear at about 18 DME. So our sort of magical numbers here that we'll write down and remember are 9 DME for the edge of the delta, uh, 13 uh, DME roughly for Gillespie itself, and then 18 DME for our left turn at Lake Jennings. And uh, we should be definitely have seen those landmarks by the time we reach those distances. Okay, so that's about it uh, that we're going to need for from a planning perspective. Uh, let's go ahead and do the flight. We are sitting at uh, Gibbs Aviation at Montgomery Field and uh, we have got our radios set up already. We've got, uh, we've listened to the ATIS uh, and found that uh, information Zulu is current. We are uh, currently have uh, Montgomery uh, field ground control set into our primary frequency and the tower into our standby. And then sitting down on the second radio on COM2, we have uh, uh, Gillespie Field Tower, which is uh, 120.7, and then uh, in the standby we've got uh, uh, Ramona Tower, which is 119.875. So uh, we won't, won't actually be using COM2, uh, uh, but uh, we've got those in there sort of as a scratch pad to remind us of what the frequencies will be when we need to put them into the uh, upper radio. Uh, we've also uh, tuned our NAV1 radio to uh, Mission Bay VOR, and uh, it turns out we are receiving that on the ground, and we'll just go ahead and identify it. So we're listening for the Morse code identifier. And that's identified. Okay, so we've already uh, completed our uh, engine start checklist because obviously our engine is running. When we reach the end of the runway, we'll skip the run up just in the interests of uh, saving a little time. Under normal circumstances and in a real airplane, we would do a run up at the uh, end of the runway there. So we'll just go ahead and give uh, ground control a call now, uh, and let them know we're ready to taxi, and then uh, we'll proceed from there. Montgomery Ground, Cessna 757 Victor Bravo, Gibbs Aviation with Zulu, ready for taxi. Cessna 757 Victor Bravo, Montgomery Ground, to show an IFR flight plan on file for you, say intentions. 757 Victor Bravo, yes sir, it's a VFR flight from uh, Montgomery Field to Ramona. Cessna 7 Victor Bravo, Roger, you submitted as an IFR. I'm gonna change that to VFR. Runway 28 left, taxi via Hotel Bravo. Runway 28 left, uh, taxi via uh, uh, Bravo, was it? November 7 Victor Bravo via Hotel, then Bravo. Hotel, then Bravo, 7 uh, Victor Bravo, thanks. And coming up directly in front of us in just a moment is the uh, part of the reason for the Miramar Bravo. We've got uh, four fighter jets out there on uh, what looks like the beginning of an overhead break for a landing. Mike, John Wind Tower, just your lateral position is sufficient when checking in with tower. Wind 250 at 4, runway 19 right, clear to land. November 242, Bravo Mike, loud and clear as always.
switch over Number to... Number 2 uh, flight heading 150, maintain VFR, below 2400. Departure frequency 127.2, squawk 7360. Go ahead and uh, switch over to the tower frequency and uh, now dial in uh, Gillespie Tower just in case we need to talk to them. We probably will be able to climb quickly enough. It would be just uh, better to have them dialed in. There are some more Number jets out there. Expected on my one line right. Go ahead now and give uh, tower a call. Number two, bro, man, can we one line right? Montgomery Tower, Cessna 757, Victor Bravo, runway 28 left with a request. Bravo Tower, go ahead. 7-Victor Bravo would like a uh, downwind departure and then a frequency change as soon as you're able in case we have to call uh, Gillespie for a delta transition. Cessna 7-Victor Bravo, roger, right downwind departure approved, runway 28 left, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, runway 28 left, 7-Victor Bravo, thanks. Final approach path is clear. Takeoff checklist. We've uh, got our trim is set for takeoff. We've got lights on. Get uh, nav lights, strobe light, and landing light is on, and uh, we're set to go. Via Alpha Lima, cross runway 1 and a left. Looking for about 400 feet AGL before we start our left turn. And there we go. Turn now to a reciprocal heading for our downwind departure, which will be a 100. Los Angeles Tower on way 25 left, good on. Okay, we've got uh, four DME from Mission Bay right now. Remember, we need to Number 7 Victor Bravo, frequency change approved. Frequency change approved, 7 Victor Bravo, thanks. Now we have plenty of time to call Gillespie if we'll need to. We're climbing smartly at about 700 feet per minute. We are at uh, 4.5 DME now. We need to be at 2500 by 7 DME. That uh, little knob of a uh, mountain hill, which is just kind of behind the pillar right now, is uh, actually also physically marks uh, the edge of the, uh, of the delta for Gillespie, which uh, I didn't notice when we were doing our original planning. We'll go ahead and make a turn now. We're now at uh, 2300. So we're just going to kind of aim at that little end of that little 
row of hills, which is a good visual path towards uh, Gillespie Field. And we're at 2400, and we're at uh, 60 ME. And we're now uh, above 2500, so we are safely over the uh, the delta for Gillespie Field. That means we will not uh, need to be calling them. Go ahead and monitor Gillespie Tower just in case. There's no harm in not doing so. And then we'll also dial in uh, 119.875 for Ramona Tower, which is the next uh, ATC uh, individual that we will be talking to. Cherokee 6 to go ahead. Cherokee 6 to 4, I for cancellation received, runway 1 and right click for the option, right close traffic approved. Nicely up to our planned altitude of 3,500, about 300 feet to go. And we can see uh, the Gillespie Airport just out here at about the 11 o'clock position. And then just a little further out there, we can see a sliver of uh, Lake Jennings, which is our next visual waypoint beyond the field. And there we are, we'll level off, 3,500 feet. And at 9 DME, as we expected, we're right at the edge of the delta. Cross runway 1 and left, and then runway 1 and left, taxi via Alpha Lima. Roma to Bravo Mike, disregard last. Hold short runway 1 and right, and check your squawk 7360. Oh, we're not too busy here, let's go ahead and uh, get the ATIS for Mona. 132.025. We'll get the tower frequency dialed back in. The number three, we're on mic. Squawk 7360 is in 123 And there's Gillespie just off of our left wing. Expected distance of 13 DME from Mission Bay as we uh, make our turn at uh, Gillespie, but uh, that's easily explained by the, some of the rounding errors in the in the distances displayed on Sky Vector. Now, looking out to our left just a little bit, uh, we can just see out here our. Uh, uh, San Vicente Island, which is going to be our next visual checkpoint and our reporting point for uh, for Ramona Tower. Uh, we don't want to turn too soon because, just as a reminder, we've got this uh, uh, delta shelf that we need to worry about, and uh, we don't want to get into this 3,200-foot uh, section because we're already above that, so we want to make sure we stay out here. So we'll fly all the way out to Lake Jenkins before we make our turn 
to uh, uh, to go to San Vicente. Go ahead and swap over to uh, Mono Tower now. We won't be talking to him for a couple minutes still, but might as well be ready. There at Lake Jennings now. We'll go ahead and start our turn. From our flight plan, the heading is about three two five. Hello, my contact, and your restriction was two thousand four hundred to below. Again, we're not quite at our expected distance of eighteen TME from Mission Bay, but uh, we're very close to it. The information Zulu was current for over the uh, Ramona Aedis. Here are landing runway 27, as we heard. San Vicente Island is just pretty much off of our nose right now. So we are uh, safely on the will be safely on the east side of that island, which will definitely place us in the 3,800-foot uh, shelf of the underneath the uh, Bravo. Tower. When you check in the tower, your position is more important than the altitude. Wind 300 at 7, runway 290, clear to land. The uh, Ramona Airport is visible uh, directly off the nose. This is a very faint white strip out so here. So away from our reporting point. We'll check our descent checklist. Power as desired. Mixture is rich. Fuel selector is set to both. That's done. And that looks like a good spot. Ramona Tower, Cessna 757 Victor Bravo, San Vicente Island, landing with Zulu. Cessna 757 Victor Bravo, Ramona Tower, make left traffic to runway 27, I should make it right traffic to runway 9, wind 0608, runway 9, equipped to land. 
We'll make uh, right traffic for runway Niner uh, and clear to land runway Niner. Seven Victor Bravo, thanks. So the wind has uh, shifted around just a little bit on us, and uh, it's running opposite direction from where we were. So we'll be making a, uh, a right uh, downwind entry for runway Niner, which uh, calls for us to fly a 45 degree entry to the pattern. Pattern altitude will uh, be, say, 2,300 feet. It's not explicitly marked on the chart, but uh, we'll give it 900 feet above uh, the runway elevation. and uh, start a slow descent down to pattern altitude now. And here we go for the 45 degree entry to the right downwind pattern. Two seven zero will be our uh, downwind heading. Cessna three, Mike Roger, runway three. Sorry, runway one nine. I left, clear, touch and go. Then flight heading. Two, four, and we're midfield there. Go ahead and get 10 degrees of flaps. Four landing checklist, fuel sector set to both, mixture is rich, landing lights are on, autopilot is disengaged. base now. But that'll be okay. Flaps are coming up.
Let's have a look at Bravo Taxi parking via Alpha, remain this frequency. Taxi to parking via Alpha, stay this frequency, thanks. So I'm Victor Bravo. And that's that flight. We'll have another one shortly where we uh, go also from a towered to a towered airport. But uh, in the next flight, the companion flight to this one, we will use flight following to help us along the way. In the meantime, have fun on the piloted network.